Well, welcome, Family Church. We are so glad that you are here. We are again in the Hall of Faith sermon series, and we will be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, where we are looking at some of the great characters of the Old Testament who have an amazing ability to walk in faith. And uh, last week, when we were looking at the, the life of Joseph, we heard a story of a young girl in our church who was going to have to go through a move. And as Pastor Jason talked with her daughter, his daughter about what was happening and that a move was coming, they, uh, they had this difficult transition or conversation where Amber said, Dad, why does God ask us to do hard things? And as that story resonated with a lot of people, Paul, you said something that I thought was pretty profound. I think that the harder thing is often the better thing. In mm-hmm. fact, it's always the better thing when it's what God calls us to. And we have a great tendency to either make a wrong choice at a pivot point or to not make a choice. And one of the things I've been impacted, I appreciated your message on Joseph, and I've gone back and I've read through Joseph's life, and it seems like every time he got his knees cut out from under him, he would start again, and by faith he would do what, was, what he could do. Mm-hmm. And he began to care for people and take charge of things. And, you know, it just is this amazing idea that whether it comes to following God or recovering from a huge blow or forgiving, that it, faith is a choice. And I think that's particularly true as we look at, at Moses' life. Yeah, today we're going to look at the life of Moses. And the way that his life breaks down, I love because it's so symmetrical. He has three sections of his life, and each of them are 40 years. So he has uh, the first 40 years, he's living as a prince in Egypt. There's a great story of how he ended up as a Hebrew growing up inside Pharaoh's house. And you're going to read that this week in your devotions. But at 40, there's a transition and things change. And the comfort of the first 40 is gone. Couldn't have been more opposite. Mm -hmm. He goes from basically being educated and pampered in the in the house of the pharaoh which was like one of the greatest nations on earth at that time mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden the next 40 years he's on what's called the backside of the desert in some versions mm-hmm. he's out there in desert land caring for sheep and goats and basically ra- having a wife and raising his kids so essentially nothing like his first 40 and then it comes back to the game's not over yet. And there's this beautiful moment where he is essentially benched for those 40 years. God calls him back into the game and sends him back to Egypt where we get to see him lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And then for 40 years, he is helping be a part of developing them. And at the end of his life, they're on the precipice of entering into the promised land. So we're going to look at Hebrews 11 and say, what are some of those choices that were made? And so Hebrews 11 kind of highlights some of those, those points. And it says... By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't it awesome just how easy faith is? You read this and it just says, by faith, when he had grown up, he looked around. It sounds like he just came up on a Thursday and said, you know what? I've decided, forget Pharaoh and his daughter, forget living in pleasure. I'm with the Hebrews. And I don't think it works that way. This is a condensed version. This is two verses smashed together. But it also comes off pretty glossy. And I don't really think the life of following God works like this. Because I think there's a difference between messy and glossy. And if you just read these two verses and not the whole of Exodus, you're going to miss out on the mess. Because as he's making this decision, he actually ends up making a very poor decision. He says, yes, I don't want to be identified with the Egyptians, with Pharaoh, with living in Pharaoh's house, with Pharaoh's daughter. I'm with the Israelites. I'm with the slaves. I'm with those who are oppressed. I'm with them. But then the actions that come out of it are where the danger comes in. He has a great call from God, and yet here's his answer to it. He goes out. His heart is now tied to the Israelites and not to the Egyptians. He sees an Egyptian slave driver beating on one of, the, uh, one of the Israelites. And he says, that's not okay. And he jumps in to stop it. And in the process, he murders. And let me say that strongly. He murders the Egyptian slave driver. That, uh, granted, the Ten Commandments are not written yet. That's still wrong. He's well <laughs> aware of that. This is a problem. And let me tell you something. Faith is a choice. 
But faith is also messy. So on your outline, I want you to put the word messy right there next to faith as a choice, because I think this is a pretty critical point. It is not as clean and cut as the two verses that come out in Hebrews. I had to smile because I think sometimes grandparents do this. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you look back at the raising of your own kids and you remember the, the highlight reels and maybe the really hard points, but you forget the daily. And sometimes when you step back into what it's like to be with mm-hmm. grandkids every single day, you realize the same thing. And I think that's an encouragement for us. Um, the whole growth of faith process, it takes time and there's... There's great moments and there's great missteps. Mm -hmm. And God is in the process of developing that in us. And it's going to be tough. Well, on that too, I would just say, I think that this is a a, a real key to understanding faith. Because I think if you have an expectation that they're going to snap your finger and you're going to get it. And you're just going to be this transition and you're never, you're not going to struggle anymore. I really, faith is a choice, but maybe we should say faith is a little bit of a process. It's It's a growing moment. I don't think it's so simple as... Sometimes we make it, and even how we expect it of others. Yeah, as you say, that makes you patient with somebody else, that maybe you're trying to Mm -hmm. help them along this journey of faith, and they seem to do three steps forward and two steps back, and it can be, you know, it's easy to get impatient with that, and yet God is at work. Well, sometimes it's the person in the mirror that's doing that three steps forward and four steps back and two steps forward and one step back. It's a difficult thing. So you guys have an outline either on your phone or maybe you have this on uh, your seat wherever you are. But we're going to look at uh, an outline a little differently today. Instead of giving you the blanks filled in, we want you to just put in what you notice. We're going to share a little bit of what we've seen in the text, but we're leaving it blank for you. So the way we're looking at this, Moses, when he's 40, has a pivot point in his life. Things are making a massive change. What was he going from to what was he going to? The one that I noticed in the text, it actually says that he chose... He, uh, he left the pleasure, flip back to it, he left the pleasure and chose to be mistreated. So if you look at on, on this, I, and this wasn't the one that I originally saw, but he went from pleasure to mistreatment. I had seen the pleasure part, but I was thinking the purpose, God called him to be a part of it. He went from pleasure to purpose. What is it that, that you were seeing, Paul, when you were looking at this? Yeah, I guess I was seeing it simply <laughs> geographically. He went from the palace to the desert. Mm-hmm. Totally opposite settings. They were different challenges for him. And... Uh, and I think you're right, that he had the right desire. God had begun developing in him an identity with the, the Jewish people, and he wanted to set them free. He wanted to get them away from the slavery. He wanted to, to discontinue the, the opposition or, or the oppression. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think sometimes when, when we've got a right heart, there are wrong ways of doing the right thing. That's a really great, well, click to the next verse because he he says something here because I think this is part of how the the transition happens in that perspective, or the pivot point comes because the view changes. And look what what he, he regarded disgrace for the sake, he regarded, notice the word regarded, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value, notice the choice there, than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to this reward. You made a comment about the Christ in here. Yeah, I I don't know if you caught that, but the writer to Hebrews is saying, that Moses, way before Jesus was born here, as we celebrate at Christmas, that he regarded Christ. And there, there is a, a wonderful picture here that Jesus is God. And so, therefore, he was involved in all of the Bible, not just the New Testament. And so, it actually identifies that Moses understood that God was calling him to a different kind of identity, a different, a different value and it says he was looking ahead to his reward. Um, I don't think that's what was on his mind when he was going after that slave driver. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, that was the direction of his life. Right. And you made a great comment about control and how that can derail our good intentions. Well, yeah. On a, the next thing on your outline is just what perspective uh, we may have on this. I, I think that the perspective that, that Moses had when he, he got this call from God... He, he, it was God by faith moving in him that he said, yeah. I am no longer with the Egyptians, I'm with the Israelites. But in the process, his response was to rush. And I think that there's a couple things that, that are really important for us to see. Um, be really careful. If you're the type of person that's a controller or you're in a hurry to make changes, uh, either one of those, I think that you can end up in the same place that, that Moses was. He had the right direction. But he decided to jump in with control. In fact, I think his perspective, and you write down what, what you see from, from Moses, but his perspective was, I've got this. I got control here. I know what I'll do. I'll take out this Egyptian slave driver. And I think that 
um, anytime you have this, this mindset, it's a little bit like an airplane. You can have perfect trajectory. You can be going the right direction. You can have the right velocity. You're going fast enough. Your, your plane will stay in the air. But if you don't pay attention to the altimeter, it's this little part of the plane that m- measures the barometric pressure and allows you to know how high are you. And let's just say you're off by 800 feet. <laughs> well, there's a side of a mountain right there. And there's a serious problem. The, 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 the critical thing here is, I think Moses had good trajectory. I think he had good velocity. I think his altitude was way off. And he ends up doing something on his own. And I, this is a huge caution. If you're someone that's a fast processor or someone that's controlling, you may try and say, God, I've got this. And you may try and take the pen and say, I'll write this story. I, I relate to that. I, I think of myself as a young pastor here at Family Church. And, you know, you're not you, a young pastor here at Family Church, Paul. <laughs> I used to be <laughs> back in the day. Um, so, the, so I had, you know, this mindset. I grew up in a church. I'm a pastor's kid. I went to Bible school. I've been a youth pastor. I kind of know what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I wish I had been more humble and needed, realized I needed more coaching and had maybe gone to more seminars and learned some things. But I kind of had that idea, like, I've got this. And mm-hmm. I look back now and I think, man, I, I, I realize now that I can't do anything that changes somebody's eternal life. Mm-hmm. they I can't talk them into being saved. I can't talk even people into being good. Um, that, that really, if God's going to do, if, if anything's going to happen, it's going to last. It's going to be because God does it. And so I think you see in the beginning of this that he starts with kind of a, a bit of pride. I agree. He'd been educated. He was probably well-versed in martial arts. He was ready for leading a strategic army. Um, you know, he, he had all this background and he was going to try to do it himself. And that's so dangerous. Can you imagine how it felt for him? I mean, the moment after when he finds out that people know about the Egyptian that he killed. And uh, just you're in your sandals and you're headed out of Egypt and you're running to the desert. The humiliation, his name, his renown, everything, his reputation, gone. it's just gone. And he's just running out there. What does that feel like? Because I, I think that he's humiliated. But sometimes when you're humiliated, if you respond properly, you can also be humbled. It can be and a I first think, step. And I think maybe the move into that next 40 years, there was some humiliation. But perhaps there's also some humbling that happens with that. I, I was thinking how good this for us is for us in this COVID crisis. Um, I, d- I don't know about you, but one of the things that's been hard for me is just the divisiveness. Everybody has their own opinion about what the government officials should do, about where masks should be, about what should happen. And, and, and there's kind of this attitude, like if I was in control, I'd be doing this right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and because of that, the toxicity of how people talk to each other and flaming each other on Facebook. And, and I caught that phrase that, that we had just mentioned that says that he, he re- wanted to be identified with the people of God, and he was looking ahead to his reward, and that perspective that says, what's really going to happen out of all of this? And and I'm concerned that that out of all of these discussions that people are having, that there's permanent relational damage being done, Mm -hmm. and that when we're done with the the COVID crisis, um, there may be some real collateral damage, because in the middle of trying to say, I've got this figured out, or I've got my opinion, or I think I'm going to tell people what is right. That's there's sad. a lot of destruction being done. As you were saying that, I was thinking, everyone that's listening, you have an opinion on masks. Yeah. And everyone out there, you have an opinion on Black Lives Matter. And in each of these, you can pick a side, and you can be completely divisive, but he identified himself with Christ. I think that's such a great, great point, Paul. So The beauty of this, though, is his life doesn't end at 40. Doesn't. That's not the end of the story, which is a great part of the story. So it says here that by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, and he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. This idea that you see what's invisible is a little bit of a beautiful (laughs) wordplay, but it's also alluding to one of the great stories of the New Testament. And this is probably where you get to the point where all the movies are made now. This is that part of his life that is far more Hollywood. Uh, only the difference between Hollywood and this is this is real. Why don't you tell us what tell us the story, Paul? What happened? Well, this is an incredibly great moment, not only in the Moses's life, but in the life of all of the 
of all of us, but all of the children of Israel, because they always struggled that they didn't have a God that they could see, that wasn't an image, wasn't a stone or a, a piece of gold. And, and here's those moments where God is revealing himself. And so it says Moses is out there in the backside of the desert. He's chasing his sheep around. And all of a sudden, it, he sees a bush that's burning and it's not being consumed. And so it sounds like just out of curiosity, he's like, well, let's check this out. He's probably bored. <laughs> he's hanging out with sheep all day long. <laughs> hey, something's burning. Let's go look. Let's go look. Moses is a pyro. Let's just go there, yeah? Guy loves fire. And all of a sudden, God speaks to him. And God reveals himself and says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And Moses falls down. And, and there's this incredible moment where this invisible God is making himself known. And, and yet it's not just a, a, a warm and fuzzy moment. He says, I'm entering your life because that same desire you had to set my people free, that's now on my heart. So we go back to the book of Exodus and it's, he tells the, the heart of the story here. And God says, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I, I think that was just a blow-your-mind moment for Moses. I mean, I honestly feel at 40 that maybe this growing discontent with being identified with the Egyptians and a growing desire to connect with the Israelites. That's, that's kind of a, a gradual transition, maybe. This, I think, came out of the blue. He did not have a clue, and all of a sudden, God says, I've got a plan. You are going to go down to Pharaoh, the, the leader of the most uh, largest and most powerful nation on earth, and you're going to take away all his slaves, over a million people, and I want you to lead them out. And I think that when he heard that, it was like, there is no way that could happen. That is impossible. I can't do it. It won't happen. I, I feel like that <laughs> that faith moment, that faith challenge, he is like totally overwhelmed. And so because of that, he starts making objections. And, and honestly, this, is, this could be a whole message by itself because I feel like when we're wrestling with those faith choices, we have a tendency to say some or all of these, and I think it really shows where Moses was. It also really shows what God was doing to help him deal with his faith struggle. Because faith is a choice, and now you see the real wrestling. This goes back to the mess. This is another messy moment that it wasn't God saying, hey, I want you to go. I've chosen you. Yes, Father, I shall go. Uh -uh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what, 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 what was his excuse, number one? Well, first of all, he said, who am I? Um, ironically, at 40, he probably would have said, I'm your man. I, I've got all that you need. And now he's switched completely and he's going, I am not qualified. I can't do this. I am unable to. And the next question, which is, who are you, God? If I tell them God sent me, how can I identify you? What, what are you like as a God and who are you? And God, God actually at this moment reveals the sacred name of God, which then becomes the, the marker of the Israelites and how they refer to God as what we would say is Yahweh. And, and I think, I was thinking back of our study in the book of Ephesians. Mm -hmm. And we went all the way through there and we, we asked those same two questions. Who is God? Mm -hmm. And who does God say I am? Because the foundation of faith is not just the circumstances, it's how well do I know God mm -hmm. and how do I relate, how do I understand myself in light of who God is? I hadn't thought of this before, but this idea of who am I? You know, you're right. Yeah, you are nobody. Yeah, he didn't argue with him. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. You got, you're nothing. But I, I, I think that's a, a profound impact or perspective here. And he goes on, well, what if they don't believe me? What if I go and say? Legitimate question, and God answers. And then he goes, well, I'm not eloquent. And the beauty of this, he goes, I'm not eloquent. And some may say he even might have had a speech impediment. He might have stuttered. That God had already prepped for this. Remember how he said, I've chosen you. He had prepped and sent his brother Aaron, was already on his way. Stirred Aaron's heart and said, I need you to go out into the desert. I need you to go find your little brother. And you go spend time with him. And the two of them meet up. He's already got scaffolding ready for him. Because Moses, if he wasn't a great speaker, okay, well, let's send some help. And he sends 
Aaron to help. And the funny thing is, once they get before Pharaoh, the first time Aaron's the, the, the main speaker, of the 10 or so times that they interact, from then on it's Moses. Moses is the one who really carries the, the weight and the, and, the, and the main speaking role. So it's kind of interesting that this was yeah, like some training wheels just to get him going. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you over this, this faith struggle you're in. But yeah. after the excuses, what's his final idea? <laughs> he, he runs out of excuses, and finally he says, God, can you just send somebody else? <laughs> and I thought this is, this is the essence we've been talking about, about what faith is. It means trusting and obeying. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that absolutely Moses was right. This was an impossible task. He couldn't do it in his own strength or because of his education or military strategies or whatever. Impossible. But God was saying, I will take you through this. And, and, and at the core of it, Moses is wrestling with, will I step into an overwhelming task because I believe that God is with me and he's calling me to it and I'm going to trust him. And I believe that that's the core essence of our wrestling with faith is what is God calling me to? Is he going to be with me? Is he going to take care of it? Is he going to make this happen? And then the bottom line, will I choose to obey? Will I say, okay? And ultimately, you Moses did. Yeah. He made that choice. And I, I think you're right. It's, it's kind of nice that the scripture includes the messy part because this is where we live. Mm-hmm. And hopefully when we get to the end of our life, we'll be able to do the Hebrews 11 look back mm-hmm. and say those were the highlights, those were the places. So, but Hold on, before you go on, I'm going to throw something at you that we did not talk about beforehand. So you'll have to think on your feet, but I want this to be for everybody. Which of these excuses do you identify with? That, that Paul Glazner says, I struggle most with this one. I'd probably have to say, what if they don't believe me? Because I think I have that tendency to say I want people to respond and accept, and I, I want to have that esteem. And I think stepping into discussions where it may go badly, it may not work mm-hmm. well, um, that probably would be the one I'd choose. What about you? Yeah, you stole mine. I, I totally, and I, what I wrote down next to this is that that one's others focused. And I think that's definitely a temptation is just because I focus on what others would think, think too. Yeah. Um, it's funny, if I, when I remember number two and I, his answer here, this one fades away. But this is one, the, probably the thing that clouds the most. And it, I know it's different for each person. Some people will have each of these that it's really hard to trust God. Others, it, it's really hard because um, they're looking at themselves and the who I am might be a, a real role in that. But we have another pivot point here. What did you see, Paul? What was Moses moving from at 80 years old to moving to that was shifting? Well, I was thinking of the big, huge change. He goes from isolation, basically me and some sheep, and all of a sudden he steps into the battle Mm -hmm. because the next whole section is about he's stepping into meetings with Pharaoh and there is the 10 plagues where they, God throws down the gauntlet and and he's right in the middle of that. And, And I think... What a huge transition that is. You know, uh, as you said that, I was just thinking of him, and I hadn't thought this before, but he, he's an in, he may be an introvert. Yeah. If he's not an introvert, he just spent 40 years in a, in a rough Developing place. Developing it. Right. And then he's going to go lead over a million people. And I was just thinking about the relational transformation. He's got his sheep, his wife, and some kids. Now he's got a different set of sheep, I'm telling you. Like, yeah. this is a million people that he's got to relate to. In fact, I think that next week you're going to center in on some of this. But I also see a shift in, in his relationship in terms of an insecurity that when you have uh, an insecure person, he'll respond to God by saying, who am I? But out of this, there's also some of the humility part of what's happening inside of him. So I love the idea that you have a, a, a transition where I think that there's some insecurity that's moving towards humility. Huh. And clearly he's moving from being a shepherd Mm-hmm. to being a leader of people. So leading Changing sheep roles. to leading people. Yeah, that's yeah. a good call. So write down something there that, you, that helps for you catalyze that, that change from the backside of the desert to now he's leading or heading into this battle with Pharaoh. And then Hebrews what, 11. Well, what's the perspective that oh, you yeah. saw on that? So I think his perspective changes from I've got this to, okay, God, you've got this or it's not going to mm-hmm. happen. Uh, yeah. You've got this, and there's that submission, that, that humility that you mentioned. 
Yeah, I saw that with, um, it, it probably comes in a little bit with the humility, but I was thinking of that, that, that movement early on where you've got to change it from pleasure to a purpose. I think this is a renewed purpose. 40 years of having that stuffed away, and here it comes back, and he has the opportunity to get into the same game that he felt he was called to earlier, right. but maybe more prepared. And in some ways, that's a little like Joseph, who had the dreams early on in his life, mm-hmm. and then for a long time, it didn't seem like there was anything coming out of those dreams, and then God puts him in the right place. And I... I think you see that same thing in Moses' heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so the last part of Hebrews eleven twenty eight says, By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. So we got to give a little background. That's this a is, lot of story. Yeah, this is a 10th plague out of 10. Okay, so this is the last one. It's the biggest one. And this is the first one where the Israelites are actually have to do something. But you got to know a little bit of the background. When Moses and Aaron come in and they go before Pharaoh, they say, let my people go that we could go in the desert and worship him. And there's some some conflict. And basically Pharaoh says no. And and God says, fine, no problem. In fact, he even hardens Pharaoh's heart to make sure that he's totally broken in the end. And basically God sends 10 plagues that utterly wipe out Egypt, including one of them is he turns the Nile into blood. There's gnats, there's darkness, there's locusts, there's frogs. That's awesome. There's basically, they're overwhelmed with frogs, but they are decimated by these. And with each one of these plagues, the children of Israel are watching. This is over a million people. They're watching going, wow, look at the power of God. And in the process, they get to the final one, this Passover one. And now they have an opportunity to be a partaker in it. They get to be a participant in it. So when it comes to the Passover, why don't you explain what was happening with this specific plague? So... I think it's interesting, as you mentioned, those specific plagues. Uh, If you do a little background study in there, uh, those were things that the Egyptians worshipped. They worshipped the Nile, they had a frog god, and and so in some ways, God is tweaking the noses (laughs) of every god of Egypt and showing himself not only to be powerful, but to be more powerful. And then you come down to this last one, which is very, very personal. And he says, if you would take a lamb, and it has to be a perfect spotless lamb. And in, in fact, this, this setting up of this ritual is what Jewish people are known for to this day, that the celebration of this moment, and they took a lamb and they killed the lamb and they roasted it and ate it and they took the blood of the lamb and they literally took a, a piece of hyssop, a plant, and they applied it to the doorposts of the house and then they went inside and God says, I'm gonna send a death angel it's going to come over the land of Egypt. And after he had been nine for nine, I think they probably believed him. And, and I don't know if they were terrified, but I think I would be. And mm-hmm. so they had to believe that this, this picture that God was setting up for the future was going to hold, that the death angel would be held off if they, if they took this step of trusting God and obeying. And if you remember my mom's testimony from several months ago, um, she talked about that we have to apply the blood to the door. We can't just set it in a little bowl beside the door and believe that, that God really is going to you know, work, that Jesus really died for our sins. But you have to actually make that personal application. So I, I feel like this was a great move where Moses and Aaron had been going, you know, battling with Pharaoh. And now all of a sudden, all the children of Israel have to make a choice. Are we going to trust in this God who's shown himself to be powerful? Are we, going to, are we going to take that blood and put it on the door of our house and be identified as mm-hmm. those who believe in the blood? It was public, right? I mean, the, 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 with the blood on the door, it's on the outside of the door. I mean, so this is going to be, I'm going to identify. So let me ask you, would you have put it on your door? I, I think I would have done anything at that moment to try to stay safe. I mean, I feel like God had shown himself extremely powerful. Yeah, I, I love that point that you made yesterday when we were talking about this, that he said, notice that this is the 10th plague, that there's some build, there's a faith building, that the moment when they have a choice, they have something to rest on. Because if you just say, hey, here's what we're going to have you do tomorrow, and you're not seeing this hand of God before, I can see um, a different perspective there. I do think that when we look at um, the pivot point in this, I think this is really great because the whole story has been about Moses. At the Passover, there's a lot of shift. It really shifts, and this is what I see, is it, it shifts from something personal with Moses to something with the people. Because now all of them are playing a role here. And we have a, you know, a mission here that we, we believe we're people helping people find and follow Jesus. 
This is that moment where it's no longer just a relationship between God and Moses. This is also a relationship between God and all of the people of Israel coming out of that. What did you see as a, in the pivot point? What was the shift that you were noticing? Yeah, I was thinking of the, similarly, that observing to acting. Mm, I love that. that. That they were kind of sitting back. In fact, sometimes they were angry with Moses because his battle with the Pharaoh ended up with them having it harder. They had to make bricks without straw now. And, and so they now had to step in and be part of it. And I think not only was it a culmination of what God had already shown them, it was a preparation because they were going to have to make several mm -hmm. more steps of faith all the way through the desert. And, and they were going to have to trust that when God spoke to Moses and that mm. Moses said, this is what God's going to do, that they would say, okay, we're in. You know what I just heard you say there? It, we hadn't alluded to before, um, but faith is never an isolated incident, mm. a faith choice. You, you never make one choice and you're good. This is going to be a process. And right now we are in places where we have to make a faith choice and there'll be another one coming soon. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's never a done deal. Well, it's done when we're dead. But if you're not dead, you're not done. So when we look at the perspective, I, I think there's a powerful one here. And in fact, we're going to lead into a time where we can have some connection with this on a personal level and do some reflection. I feel like the main perspective that came from this, and it's for all the people, is I trust you. I trust you enough to kill a lamb and then take that blood and put it on the doorpost in front of everyone. I'm in. I, I'm really here. And there's, there's a beautiful thing that would happen for the Israelites every year on the anniversary of this, that every year they would celebrate. It's called, they would call it Passover, and they would celebrate it for 1,400 years. They celebrated this every single year. And then one time there's this Jewish guy who had 12 of his closest friends together for the Passover. His name was Jesus, 1,400 years later. And he sat down, and he went to do the Passover, and they had done the exact same words for the last 1,400 years. And Jesus says, you know what, that script... We're going to put that to the side. And he changes it, and he takes the bread, and he, and he breaks the bread, and he says, this is my body. And he's essentially changing the Passover from remembering what happened with Egypt to now he's about to die on the cross. And he says, from now on, you're going to do this to remember me. Hmm. And, and they, they called it the Lord's Supper or communion. And that's something for the last 2,000 years that we as followers of Jesus have done. And so we're excited that we're going to just spend a little time doing communion with you um, what we'd like you to do, if you don't have the stuff out, you can just press pause if you're watching at home. Those of you who are watching from a venue, it should be on your chair. And what we'd like for you to, to do is we want you to evaluate what is the trust moment that God's calling you into. Because the breaking of the bread is the moment where we're remembering that, God's, that Jesus' body was broken. And when we take the juice, it's remember that his blood was poured out for us. That every, and I, I like to think of it this way, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Doesn't he also care about every other decision that we make along the way? And so if, if you're saying, I need, I need to see a, a, like a, a greater clarity of who Jesus is, this is exactly a moment to bring your heart and your mind back to that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pray uh, for us, and then what we're going to do is we're going to um, release for you to have a moment where you just have some time to pray, um, to take communion, um, and then we'll come back with some closing uh, challenges and some ideas for some discussions we want you to have. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for stories of faith. I thank you that you give us the insight that it's messy. God, I pray for those of us who are making faith choices right now, and it's messy, that you would help us in the mess. Lord, I pray that for those who are controlling and rushing, I pray that you'd help us to slow down and trust you. Lord, I pray for um, those of us who, in the middle of this faith step, we're seeing the pain and we're saying, why is this so hard that you would help us to say it's for the better? God, I pray that more than anything, you would raise the trust level here amongst us. Lord, we thank you for the blood and we thank you for the body, the body that was broken, the blood that was poured out where Jesus hung on the cross so that we who are sinners could have a relationship with you. God, I pray that as we take communion, you will help us to see what in us is sinful and needs to change and that you will continue to do that work of transforming us. We love you, Jesus, and in your name we pray. Well, you can take communion whenever you are ready. So I hope that's a spiritual moment for you to do some reflecting and thinking about your own response to Jesus, your own response to the crisis. And, and I want to just challenge you, as we've talked about how pivot points change our perspective, uh, clearly we're in unprecedented times is the phrase I keep hearing. And 
we've never been here before. And so we're at a pivot point. And those, those pivot points are places we need to make choices. Not just get through, not just drift along, but to make choices by faith. And I, and I guess I want to challenge you to think through, what does that mean for you? Um, some things we used to be spending our time on are not available anymore. And some things that, that we used to do easily are now really hard. And so I, I want to challenge you, what is it that God's speaking to you to say, during this tough time, here's what I hope you're getting. Here's what I hope you're learning. Here's, here's how you're making those choices. And, and I'll give you a couple of suggestions. Maybe you're realizing that, that your spiritual life has been really built on a lot of props on the outside. That if you don't have a, a church service or if you don't have a life group or if you don't have something that you're attending, you quit reading your Bible and you quit praying and, and, and a lot of those personal disciplines kind of have been propped up by external things. And it's a great opportunity for you to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a recommitment to have my faith be so personal that it isn't changed by what happens outside of me. And for some of you, maybe... You've been speaking angrily and hurtfully, and you need to go make some apologies. You need to say, I'm sorry. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's, first of all, more important than your opinion on masks or on anything else. And for some of you, maybe you've just gotten lost in the, the depression and the aloneness, and, and you, you feel like you're out in the backside of the desert, and yet to believe that God still has a plan for you. One of the things I was struck in about this story is it says that he brought them out of Egypt 430 years to the day, just like he'd promised. And I, I don't think we can have a, a big enough picture for how God is working all things together. And, and even the fact that a lamb was used at the Passover was a picture of Jesus. And he was working all this together. And when you see that, then it enables me to participate in a little bit that I can do. So I don't know what that is for you. Maybe it's just that you'd be more kind and encouraging. Uh, somebody came up to me last week and they said, Paul, I know that this is a tough time and, and I know that it's a tough time for pastors. What can I pray for you about? Mm. It's like, wow, I, 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 that just encouraged me for a couple of days just to know that somebody was asking that question. So as you're thinking about this time that we're in, I want you to say, Lord, what is it that you want me to learn and to change and to do and to by, by faith step out and begin to do those things. So take a moment now, if you're watching with your family, if you're in one of our campuses, uh, follow the host, whoever's there with the directions, but I encourage you to process this by telling somebody, here's the step of faith that I feel like God's asking me to take, and no more excuses, I'm going to take it. Hope that's really challenging to you. God bless you this week.